I don't think we can debate the fact that diets are all the rage. I don't know which one you're on this month. Uh, I've been on one for four. I like this one right now. But uh, I've been through a few. Been through a few. Seems to be working for me at the moment. I don't have a problem with diets, really. I don't have a problem with nutrition. I don't have a problem with vegetables. Well, maybe I do. Vegetables. But, I have a problem with Christians reading the Bible and grabbing on to random stuff and then going and telling other Christians they have to do that stuff to really be Christians. Now, there's stuff the Bible says you're supposed to do. I mean, don't kill people. Like, that was really clear. But what you're supposed to eat with the exception of the bread and wine of the supper that you are supposed to eat, but what you're supposed to not eat, the Bible doesn't seem to care too much about that. And yet, and yet, I guarantee you, ah, I should have checked before I guarantee it, I guarantee 99%, if you go and find our one remaining, I think, Christian bookstore in Rockford, which I don't recommend you find, if you don't know where it is, good for you, I don't. But if you go and you find it, and you do a little digging in their bookshelves, and you look for something on nutrition or diet, you will find a book that has, if not as its main idea, close to its main idea, Daniel chapter 1. And in that book, they will talk about the diet that Daniel had and clung to, which enabled him to be a success in the land of the Chaldeans. And if you will take this same kind of nutritional path, you too can have such an amazing life now. And what I don't like about that is a whole bunch of stuff. First, ah, oh, first, where do you begin? Colossians is where I'll begin. Paul writes to the Colossians, a bunch of Greeks, right? Non-Hebrews, people who are not descended from David or from Abraham and really have nothing to do with the Old Testament worship of Yahweh at the temple in Jerusalem, which no longer eh, might exist. It's going to soon be destroyed by the time he's writing they're not a part of that. They've not had to be circumcised. They have been baptized into Jesus. But they have some people telling them that they need to do all the stuff that was done at that temple if they're really going to be Christians. And he writes to them to say, what on earth are you doing? That's not what Jesus is about. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Nobody should come saying something that, yeah, sure, it makes sense, and then water you down. Well, what's being watered down? The word of God, that's what? The plausible argument, just a man-made idea, watering down what God has said. He reminds them, as you've received Jesus Christ, walk in him. What does that mean, to walk in Jesus Christ? Now, he's going to explain that if we let him. You can fill it in with whatever you want. But if we let him say it, he's going to say it means to be rooted and built up as you were taught. To walk in Jesus Christ is to walk rooted on words that came to you. Not the act of teaching, but the things that were taught that made you a Christian. Get rooted in that. And make sure that nobody takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world. Maybe you don't think about philosophy as something you're in danger of being taken captive by because, much like eating your vegetables, doing your philosophy homework in Philosophy 101 was not also a very exciting thing. And so you weren't under threat from either of these things. But the thing is, philosophy is not just about old men in chairs at colleges. Philosophy is about ideas that exists behind and underneath a culture. And if you are unable to perceive the assumed philosophies of your age, then you are going to believe them. You won't be able to stop it. You're just not that strong. Paul says, don't let that happen. Don't let the deceits of the present age, the zeitgeist, the, the time ghost is what that literally means, the spirit of the culture, take you away from Jesus with empty deceit. Empty deceit. And then he goes right at it. What's the empty deceit the, the Colossians are in trouble with? Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. These are a shadow. 
Now, what food and drink is he referring to? The many food and drink rituals and or traditions that Judaism was still clinging to, even without the temple in the exile, going back to the temple at Jesus' time, and then also to this day without the temple once again. These things connected to what was established on Mount Sinai as part of them receiving the holiness of God as a free gift are things that have passed away because when the shadow is there, that's fine. But when the real thing comes, it's a whole nother level. The shadow is Jesus. Jesus is the real thing. Or to say it a different way, the way Jesus says it, you can't put old, excuse me, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. It'll destroy everything. So when Christ comes to institute his New Testament, he does away with the old circumcision, animal sacrifices, and whatnot, in part because he fulfills the sacrifices. There's no need for sacrifice now. He did it. And he institutes new things, washing with water, eating bread and wine. Those aren't the shadow. Those are the fullness of what has surely come. But the old things, the food and drink of the Old Testament, don't eat shellfish, only eat meat with a cloven hoof, make clothing that is never mixed between two different materials, so no polyester cotton mixes for you, huh? that kind of thing. All of that, whatever it was, some wise, some weird, all of it is a shadow of the real thing. And he says, let no one pass judgment on you because you don't follow the shadow since you've come to follow the real thing. With Christ, you have died. Why would you then, as if you were still living in this world, needing to save yourself from it, why would you ever submit to any regulation somebody comes along and says, do this or you will not be saved? I'm not saying don't pay your taxes. When the government says if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to jail. Well, you're going to go to jail if it gets to that point. That's not what I'm talking about. But when the government says, burn incense on this altar to Caesar, for he is God. Well, not, you're not supposed to do that one. You just let them kill you at that point, rather than worship that false god. And that's what's going to happen with Daniel. Now, don't make any mistake you can go and find all sorts of not just diets, but also practical advice for a million different things, whether at your Christian bookstore or at the New Age section of any other bookstore. And these all have the appearance of wisdom. They all look like a really good tool for spirituality. They promote things. Oh, I love it. You both got the word wrong today. First and second service. Is it asceticism? Is it ascetism? It is... Asceticism. What's asceticism? Think monks in the Middle Ages. I'm going to wear coarse clothing and beat myself, right? I'm going to take a vow of poverty. Asceticism. And severity to the body. See, when someone comes along with a false religion, if they dress in an orange robe and sit all day staring and eating very little and say things like love, 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 everyone goes, oh my goodness, they must really know who God is. And if you don't think I'm right, go Google Dalai Lama. I mean, people really think he knows. It has the appearance of wisdom, but all it does is promote self-made religion that won't stop your flesh from putting you in the grave. Christianity is a different thing entirely, and Paul wants us to have no doubt about that whatsoever. Jesus as well. He's, he's pretty clear that he's not here to make sure that we follow all the right little rules. Now, ultimately, does he want us to be regenerated? Good humans, people who love duty and service and hope and all that kind of stuff. Yes, he does. But he also knows you're not going to become a regenerate human being pursuing the good of your neighbor rather than your own good by him giving you a checklist. A checklist particularly that has to do with your diet and your clothing. Although as we'll touch on, there are plenty who want to say those things could in fact make you a better person. Not, not Jesus. And so when he's confronted over this kind of thing and this kind of thinking, this kind of philosophy, this time ghost zeitgeist culture spirit of the Jews, I don't mean by blood, I mean the Pharisees by spirituality, when they come to him and they say, Jesus, you're not telling people to follow the checklist, he doesn't have any time for it. Now their particular checklist did not only include the rules of Torah, 
Right? Moses books about how the priests were to cut the goat apart and put the fat over here and the other portions here and burn it and this and all that. It was that too. But there was a whole bunch of other stuff you also had to do. They called it the tradition of the elders. And the tradition of the elders was believed by them to have come directly from God on Mount Sinai. Not in the Middle Ages, Middle, Middle Ages not in the intertestamental period. Not from the prophets, all the way back at Mount Sinai, when, you might recall, when no animal could touch the mountain lest they die, and the people had to stay away, and Moses went up to the top, he went up, he came back a couple times, but eventually, he's got to bring with him 70 of the elders of Israel. And they also go up into the fiery cloud, which, that'd be terrifying. They get in, they're safe, nothing happens, God gives them some food, they eat, they go home. So what had happened during the intertestamental time, that is after the last prophet, before Jesus comes, is sayings attributed to that group in theory became established as the oral word of God that went with the written word of God. Think Roman Catholic views of tradition and what's been said and added since the Bible. Kind of like that. Still from God. Yeah. So they asked Jesus, why aren't you teaching people that, to wash their hands just right. It's not about germs. It's about being just perfectly clean enough to not defile yourself with the ritual meals that keep you part of the kingdom from which the Messiah will eventually come. And Jesus, don't you know, if you don't do these things, the Messiah will never come. So get on board with this thing. And he's got no time. <laughs> you don't even believe the commandments. And you're sitting here wanting me to wash my hands? What are you talking about? You hypocrites, two-faced. Isaiah said it, and that was a long time ago, but it's true now. You talk, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Well, no, nah, he wouldn't say it that way. God, 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 the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. But your heart is far from me. Vanity do you worship. That's yourself. Teaching as doctrines the commands of men. And he shouts to the whole crowds. <laughs> it's not that what goes into your body, that's the problem. It's what comes out. That's what is the problem. And his disciples come to him. I love their question because it's so like yesterday and the last year, right? It's like on Twitter. Pharisees offended at words of Jesus. Right? Um, they're offended by it, whatever. And Jesus really is like, whatever. His words are more offensive after they are offended. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. That is, if you're not a Christian, the devil planted you and you're going to be destroyed. That's his answer to they were offended. They're offended. Well, if the devil planted them, that's the way it's going to be. That's, that's his take. Where's the charity from Jesus? Well, Jesus does have charity. He just doesn't show it to those who reject him directly with loud and annoying and direct attacks. He has charity for the faintly glimmering wick that needs to be blown into a fire. But for the one who says, I have plenty of fire without Jesus, Jesus has no time. He even says, leave them alone. Not try to convert them. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. It's very ominous. Very ominous. And then he goes on to explain to Peter, because Peter would still ask, I still don't get it. What, what, what do you mean? Peter, if you eat food, it goes in the toilet later. If you speak words, they're what you think. That's the problem, is what you think. Oh, kind of get it. So then, what's the deal with eating food? Now, what's going on then in, in Daniel chapter 1, which seems to be all about eating food? Now, I want to emphasize, as we dig into that, we're on... A year of exile and return. That the Old Testament story of being driven from Jerusalem and back to Jerusalem is a giant metaphor, real history, but metaphor of God driving mankind out of paradise and then drawing us back through Jesus. We have been exiled from perfection by our own most miserable fault, and we are being brought back to perfection by the king who will lead us there. Exile and return. 
And in this then, we can remember Psalm 18 too, which I will bring up often this year, that the Lord, God, the God who's doing this is our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our shield, our stronghold, our trumpet of salvation. He is someone that will never pass away. None of his words will ever pass away. His salvation of you will never pass away. And then building on what we learned last year about singing the Lord's song. Last, not last year, excuse me. Building on what we learned last week about singing the Lord's song even while we're in this foreign land. Daniel is going to emphasize for us that we sing that song on the basis of God's word. That we believe God's word even when we're not near or don't see what God's word says. That's going to be what we get from him now. We do have to kind of at least relish a little bit of review from verse 1 here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, if you were here last week, I hope, at the very least, you're like, Jehoiakim. He's one of the two guys, right? Like one of them. But which one? J1 is who he is, right? He's the father of the J2. He's the one who watches his brother get destroyed by the Pharaoh. Maybe helped it happen, becomes king in his place under the Pharaoh, but then turns around to watch Pharaoh get destroyed by Babylon, and there's Babylon right there. And he goes, okay, I'll serve you, Babylon, no problem. Nebuchadnezzar opens the gates of Jerusalem, enters in, grabs all these vessels of silver and gold from the holy temple. Who? Dangerous thing that takes him back to his own temples in Babylon, Chaldea, otherwise called. Puts them in his temple. This might refresh your memory later when a son of a son of his pulls those out and starts drinking out of them at a party. And this ghostly hand appears on the wall. Remember that one? That's all connected to this. It's under Jehoiakim that that stuff is taken. And with that stuff is taken also 7,000 of the most precious, intelligent Athletic, next generation of Israel, the youths, the noble youths, 7,000 are taken, among whom are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, Jehoiakim will reign another 11 years before he's killed in that battle, maybe with the Moabites, and then J2 comes on, and he gets like 18 months, right? And then Zedekiah's on, and he gets a little more time. It's like nearly two decades before the whole thing's done. And guess where Daniel is that whole time? In Babylon. More than that, chapter 2, which tells us about Daniel rising to prominence in ruling over Babylon, happens before the end of Jehoiakim's reign. And he will reign, he will not reign, he will lead or be overseen, wise, uh, scary to all of the magi of Babylon and unto, through Babylon's fall, Persia, well over 70, 80, maybe 90 years living there after being a youth taken away. He will live to see the exiles return, although he will not return himself. Fascinating life that must have been. We won't again dig into all of this, but his life there is built upon him being inserted into their system of wisdom. We'd call it college. (laughs) Uh, It wasn't quite college, though, but it was. It was like college and then mixed with Hogwarts because it was the school of magic. And we would say, or it does say things like magicians in here, but not like card tricks. I mean, these guys are trying to make actual potions and poison Changing straw into gold if they could. Talking to voices that they find through spiritual rituals. We call those demons. Reading the stars. It's quite possible they're actually achieving stuff with this. And Daniel's being put into this school to learn how to do it. And a huge question is, how is that possible? How can Daniel be one who learns to be better than all of the sorcerers of the Magi, without ever betraying his faith in the God who says, don't do any of that stuff. Well, that's a little between the lines there. What we know for a fact is that he did it. He made it. And this story is how we know that. 
Because far beyond being unwilling to conjure up the dead or some spirit to send magical whatever's wherever, he won't even eat their food. And that's really going to bring us into where we need to be. So they're brought into this college. They're going to be taught. And they're commanded to eat not just any food but food from the king's table. And I know you might be, well, goodness gracious, it's probably filet mignon. That wine had to be a good Cabernet, maybe even Italian. I mean, it couldn't have been that bad. What's his problem? Oh, wait. Maybe the problem is that God hates meat and loves vegetables, and God knows the wine and alcohol is the devil's drink. Maybe that's the problem. Seems to be that's what the story says, or so some will tell you. Let's... Let's get there. Let's get there. They're given this food from the king's table. It then backs up a little bit here and tells us a little more about these guys' names. And I want to touch on that because they're fun. All these names have meanings. And their meanings are always tied to their God. So their Hebrew name is tied to the true God, Yahweh, or the word El, which just means God. And then their Babylonian names are tied to various gods of the Babylonian pantheon. So Daniel, Hebrew which means God is judging, eventually comes to be called, not usually by us, but by the book, Belteshazzar, which means Bel, the chief god of the Babylonians, Bel, save the king. Now, maybe more important than any of this, Daniel's name, God is judging, God is judging the nations, that's the meaning of the whole book. Everything in the book. If you read further, there's all these visions. It gets really scary. It all is about God saying the nations are going to fall, but my Christ is in charge. Daniel, God is judging. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. He gets named Shadrach, which is like Marduk and something, something. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of you got it. it. It has the name Marduk, who is a mid-level high god of Babylon. We don't know what Marduk was doing in the name, but it's there. Mishael, he is like God, or he reflects God. He gets called Meshach, which like, really means we have no clue. <laughs> uh, we, we have no clue what Meshach means. It may be tied to a proto-version, like, like a centuries before it really happened version of Venus, who shows up in the Roman pantheon, but no one really knows. Azariah, we can say more about. His name means Yahweh aids, or Yahweh helps. And his new name, Abednego, means slave of Nebo. So Bel was number one, Nebo was number two. Daniel is Bel saved the king. Abednego is slave of Nebo. We're given that bit of information, and then we're told that Daniel immediately doesn't want to do what he's told. He doesn't want to eat the food. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to let him not do this. And this chief of the eunuchs, he's, a, he's kind of a nice guy because, frankly, given the way the ancient world works, it, it's a little like Oliver in, you know, in the orphanage. You know, please, sir, may I have some more? More? Right? Th- that kind of thing. He, Daniel could have been killed just for this. Just for this. But this guy seems to have taken a liking to Daniel. So he's like, hey, man, like, I fully feel you. I get it. But if I don't let you eat the good food, and then you look like a scrawny weekly, and you could use a little meat right now, I can tell. If you don't do that, and it turns out you don't look so good, I'm the one that's going to die. So not going to do it for you. Yeah? Daniel says, hold on. Let's just take 10 days. I mean, how much can happen in 10 days? How much can you ruin your health in 10 days? It's a fair question. Huh? Test your servants, give us vegetables and water, and then see what happens. So they do the test. And at the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were given to drink and gave them vegetables. And all the mothers go, ha, see kids, see. Here's the thing, we got a couple of things. Again, how much can you change your health in 10 days with food? Now, if you eat nothing but Twinkies and alcohol for years, 
and you go for 10 days with vegetables and water, you might actually see an improvement. It's possible. I, 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 would, I would grant that. But that would be rather extreme, and I don't think that's quite where Daniel was. There's this other piece that's fairly important to know here as well. Do you know, and this is not common knowledge, it should be, because of the rise of these spiritualities that are out there. Do you know that if you eat nothing but plants with water, you will get sick and probably, eventually, early die? You cannot live on just plants and water as a human. Are you an omnivore? Yes. Like, yes, you are. And any vegan, this popular movement that says they never eat anything that's not plant-based because we don't want to harm the animals. I mean, it's a nice sentiment. I get it. If they're really into that and know, they will tell you, of course that's true. You can't eat just vegetables. That's why we take supplements. To be a vegan, you must take supplements. Can you be a vegetarian without supplements? Yes, because you're then getting the dairy, which is animal product that's going to have some of the fats that you just can't get enough of them from the vegetables. So what this again means is that the diet which Daniel has put on is actually not that good for you. Not by itself. I mean, if you are significantly wrestling with the need to lose weight, it would help in some ways. But in terms of providing your nutrition so that after just 10 days, you're actually stronger, you put on five pounds of lean muscle, it's not going to do that. It's not going to do that. Now, I got to bash on the, the vegan, even vegetarian bit a little bit more here just for your sake. Because you think it's just about food, but it's not. It's not. Vegetarianism and veganism then in particular exists in the United States and the world today because it was founded as a religion and not the religion you think. Today, most vegans are probably pagan, atheist type people. They like Gaia, the earth goddess, or something like that. They don't know that there was another religion before theirs that started this whole mess, but they'll still quote the prophetess who started it. They will talk about how their moral, their ethic for what they will and will not eat is based on the idea that one should never eat anything with a mother or a face. You may have heard that. Maybe not. They still say it. Mother or a face. Notice the anthropocentric nature of their assumption. What about the poor little amoeba, for goodness sakes? Anyhow, those words, mother or a face, were first quoted and preached by a woman named Ellen White. Ellen White is the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a prophet in the 1800s, led people out onto a hill, believing the world was about to end. They sold other stuff. They went out there. They waited. The night came and went. Nothing happened. They did it again a year later. Happened again. Nothing happened. They just settled down and said, well, it'll happen eventually. And they started doing other stuff, like having visions about how if you don't eat any meat, then the young men will no longer go off in corners and do the things that we really would agree young men shouldn't do alone in a corner because it is uh, sexual immorality. So... Got to get the meat out to fix the lack of sexual immorality. Now, ah, fascinating, right? I think you will agree with me that the vegetarian vegan movement has not exactly stopped the sexual immorality of our culture, right? Maybe it's gotten worse. I mean, soy, all that. Anyhow, the real point is to see that this has never been detached in our society from false teaching churches that don't believe what Paul said in Colossians and believe that to be a real Christian, you have to eat the right kind of food. And they'll look at this kind of verse to say it. And I want to give you one more tool. I know it's a long sermon. It's an amazing text. When you look at this text and you see Daniel eating vegetables for 10 days and then looking better, you have two different kinds of assumption you can make, but you can't make them both together. One is that it was the, the diet, the nutrition, that made Daniel stronger. The text doesn't say that. You have to assume that. And when you assume that, please notice, you are using a very modern way of looking at things. You are assuming that there are no miracles involved in the story whatsoever. Zero. It's all just according to nature. Yeah. 
This is like those who want to say that the Red Sea didn't really part. It was the Sea of Reeds to the north, and the tide went out that time of year. And when Moses turned the river to blood, well, there was algae that floated up that time of year. It's that kind of thing. A liberal argument about the text. The other option is to think that perhaps 10 days on one diet that really isn't that great for you, that puts on lean muscle mass, perhaps God got involved. Perhaps God was there. Perhaps God was even doing something that he had already promised to do directly. And this is where, if you don't understand these defiling rules from uh, the old covenant for this people of God, that it's not the meat on the table that Daniel has a problem with. It's that the meat was sacrificed to the king and his gods before him. And then they say, eat it now. He can't do that. Same is true with the wine. It's because of that that he won't do it. Because of these rules that God would, if they stayed away from foreign gods, in Israel, give them all sorts of blessings. Their herds would never have stillborn among them. Their boundaries would be expanded. They would live long, long lives without sickness and with great amounts of health. And all of this was strictly because God would be their God and deliver it by the word of his mouth. So when Daniel says no to the food... And then he just eats a really not exciting garbage, well, maybe not garbage, but not sufficient meal. And 10 days later, he's looking pretty good. It is a fulfillment of God's promise to his people descended from Abraham that if they did not worship false gods, he would bless them body and soul. Now, you don't have that promise in the same way. You do have the promise to be blessed body and soul, but not in the present age. You have the promise that the exile is still here, but at the end of the exile, your body will be ten times, hundred times better than the one you have now. What you have now is strictly that spiritual resurrection. The faith which is able to trust that God will do what he said he is going to do even though it doesn't look like it. And think about this for Daniel. He's sitting there in Babylon where his own God has abandoned the city that he used to go to. They've taken away some of the implements, maybe even the Ark of the Covenant. They can't keep the religion anymore. It looks like it's over. And he says, I'll trust God anyway. I'll die if I have to. I'll trust God anyway. Same faith. And he trusts and God fulfills the promise he had of old. What's your promise? I washed you into the death and resurrection of Jesus. I feed you with the body and blood of Jesus. The church, that's you, shall cling to these words and never be overcome by the heathen nations of this age. And when the Son of Man who reigns over them all with a rod of iron comes again with Archangel shout and trumpet blast, I will raise you immortal, imperishable, and everlasting to take you back into the real promised land. That's your promise. After this, they finish class. <laughs> they go to their tests. Daniel beats everybody. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they do real well, and within a couple of years, they're in charge of everything. It's really something. Again, Daniel's there till the first year of Cyrus. There's so much more. But what you need to hold tight to as we continue to try to gather the, the core nuggets of the Old Testament is that as different as it looked and felt and really was because of the shadows, it's not any different at all. You have the same God who says stuff. And when he says stuff, he means it. And when he promises stuff, it happens. And you are resurrected to believe what he's promised to you. Nothing can take it from you. The world will fall. The world will rise. The world will fall again. And that word will go. And with you in that word, you too will live forever. With Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I wonder which name we'll call them when we see them in paradise. Hebrew. Or Chaldean, in the name of Jesus, amen.